I didn't see you there. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Joe Alanis, and I'm going to talk to you about a monologue. A monologue by William Shakespeare from Two Gentlemen of Verona, the character of Long. Now, <clears throat> I hope you'll stick with me. It shouldn't take too long. Three, maybe four hours. Just kidding. 20 minutes-ish. So, this is going to be really good for you for auditions. So, I want to approach this in the sense of creating an audition piece using this monologue. So, the character of Lons in Two Gentlemen of Verona is one of Shakespeare's clowns, or fools, they say. And they're usually lower class, slower characters. But the ironic thing is Shakespeare often uses them to say um, some of the wisest things about the play or to portray the different lessons of the play uh, or to satirize uh, the main characters of the play. Um, so I'm going to show you some pictures of Shakespeare's clowns, so to speak. So Lance is a really fun character, and this is a really fun monologue. He has a dog named Crab, and he's always on stage with his dog. And I've never actually played this part. Uh, I was in a version of Two Gentlemen Ver of Verona, but it was a, a musical version that my professor wrote that actually won him a Tony Award like a million years ago. And we did it at UCLA at college, and, and I was in that, and that was a really fun production. And this is a really fun show. Shakespeare uses clowns and fools even in comedy, and they're often very physical. Use a lot of physical comedy, slapstick, falls, things like that. And Lawns has a dog in this piece, and you can use that whether you use a real dog or a fake dog. This is for an audition, so you would be using a fake dog, unless you brought a dog to an audition for some reason, but that's probably not a good idea. So you would use a, a fake dog, and you could use that to do a lot of comic bits, and I'll show you a little bit of that a little bit later in hour three of this production. Just kidding. If you were to go to an audition and say you were doing Lance's monologue from Two Gentlemen of Verona, 99% of them would think you were doing the other monologue. He has another monologue where he uses shoes as sort of puppets, and it's really funny. But a lot of people do that monologue, a lot of them. And so I think if you did this one, which is just as funny, which involves a dog peeing and him playing different characters yelling at him, I think it would be refreshing for auditioners. So if you were to say, I'm doing Alonso's monologue, they might be like, oh, great, here come the shoes. Uh, and you have you could do a really good job of it, but a lot of people just use it because everybody does, and then they don't do a good job with it. So I think if you did a good job with this one, it would be even more exciting for them, and I think they would uh, be more engaged. It's sort of like when you go to a musical audition, and then the girls come in, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to be doing Eponine. And now I'm all alone again, nowhere to turn, no one to go to. And then the audition is like, oh, great. So this is fresh. This is good. This is a good monologue to do. So you should do this one. And you'll see in a little bit why. Just love coffee break. <coughs> so, of course. The very first thing you want to do in preparing for a monologue or audition is read the play. So I don't really have time to go into 
a whole summary of the play because this happens later in the play, but I'll give you context for the monologue. But please, please read the play. That's so important. They might ask you questions about uh, why you made certain choices, and so you'll have to tell them and be able to support it with uh, backup from the play with what you read. So it's very important to read the play. I know you know that, but just reiterating. So this play takes place in Verona. Do you know what other Shakespeare play takes place in Verona? You guessed it, Romeo and Juliet. So they could have been walking around, maybe they walked by the Capulets and the Montagues. So anyways, it's in Italy, right? And so Lon is a servant to Proteus and Proteus makes him go to Milan um, because he's pursuing a girl there, Sylvia. And Lon is supposed to give her a little dog, but Lon loses the dog or it gets stolen. And so he decides that he's going to give her his dog, Crab. And Crab is his best friend. He loves Crab. He's so loyal to Crab. And so this monologue shows him after he tried to give her the dog, but everything that goes wrong when he's trying to give her the dog, the dog does some stuff, and he takes the blame for it because he doesn't want the dog to be punished. He's a selfless character, and he takes the punishment for the dog, and it's really funny. So that's the context of this monologue, is him telling about that story. Okay. So like all of Shakespeare's comedies, this is about characters falling in love and things. And Launce's love is a more pure love. It's a very selfless love. He's willing to sacrifice in order to protect his dog, whereas his master, Proteus, his love is much more selfish. So Launce, even though he's a lower status character, actually acts much more nobly than his master, and he is much more selfless and giving, where his master is just looking out for himself. His relationship with Crab also is almost like a parody to the other relationship, some of the other relationships in the play. Launce's love is more selfless in that he's willing to sacrifice punishment for Crab, whereas characters like Proteus, his master, who's pictured here, is more of a selfish love. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, technique here about, so when you're being pulled by a dog, let's say, you know, you have the dog on a leash, and you see the difference between this movement but if you're actually pulled, it's more of a, and there's tension there, right? You're trying to pull it. Oh, you're trying to top. And so you sort of lead, lead with your arm like you're being pulled. Okay, so imagine it's pulling you like you're walking one way, and then it pulls you the other way. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just, okay, okay, just come on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he's, he hasn't eaten, he's very, he's, <laughs> He's definitely, stop it, crab, oh, oh, you know. So you could use a lot of that sort of physicality in, in your monologue, as long as it serves the story of the monologue, right? So after you read the play, you're going to obviously want to create your character. And think about your character's age, posture, how they stand, move, gestures, and try not to, I would advise you to not look at other YouTube performances because you might end up copying, which is fine if you want to do that. But I think it's better to come up with your own interpretation of the character, right? And decide what you want to do, what makes it unique to you, and how do you relate to this character. So. So think about that, the physicality of the character and then their voice. And you could look at pictures of the character to sort of stir your imagination. 
uh, and then come up with it, come up with the, what the character wants in the play and the environment of the play, all that stuff that you know, okay? So we're gonna talk about this monologue specifically, uh, but I'm not gonna impose any character choices on it. I'll leave that up to you. I'll just kind of show you what it means and help you to make your own decisions, okay? Okay, so when you're coming up with the character's voice, uh, one suggestion that I like to make is a lot of people fall into the trap of just because it's Shakespeare and it's a lower class character, they fall into the trap of using Cockney, right? Even though it's set in Italy. So they'll be like, oh, hey, mate, what you doing there, governor? Oh, look, oh, look, that, that's what I'm talking about. Right. And then I would advise against that. I would actually advise against using a British accent as well because although Shakespeare was British, this play is set in Italy and a lot of it shows. It might make the auditioner think that you just are just automatically doing British just because you think all Shakespeare is British, right? So I would say to do a standard, standard English or standard American accent with no, no accent. So, so if you went from one extreme and you did Cockney, it would be to be or not to be. That is the question, right? But then, then if you did British, it would be to be or not to be. That is the question. You make it a little more subtle, and you do standard, standard English. Uh, where it's not so, such a thick British accent, but it's sort of standard English, it might be to be or not to be, that is the question. Very, very subtle. But then if you did standard American, it might uh, be a little more, more American and less English, so I think this might work best. It would be something like to be or not to be. That is the question. So it's basically you're just pronouncing everything right and not using any sort of accent. Because then if you went even further into an American accent, it might be a little too much. It might sound something like, to be or not to be, that is the question. It's very subtle, but you see the difference between or and or, you know, so the American R is a lot, or the, the tongue sort of, goes to the size of the roof of the mouth, and it's more American, American. So try to make it more just standard English, American, to be or not to be. And then you can build certain vocal tics or idiosyncrasies out of that. But let that be your base, okay? So what I want you to do now is if you could pull up the monologue, it's in Act 4, Scene 4, Two Gentlemen of Verona, and it's a monologue there. Just go ahead and pull it up, print it, or take a screenshot of it, preferably if you could have an iPad or something, or a phone where you can mark it, that would be great. So I'll wait. Go ahead. <clears throat> You know, maybe it will be better if we just pause. So go ahead and pause it. Get a copy of the monologue, Act 4, Scene 4, of Two Gentlemen of Verona, and come back. Oh, hi, are you back now? Great. So let's go through this monologue, and I'm going to sort of just show you what it means in regular current day conversation, and we can go from there, OK? Okay, so take a look at this picture here of the monologue. Uh, I've marked it in different sections. So the first section, when a man, and I'm going to read it neutrally too, so, so that you don't end up, you know, copying my intonations or pronunciation. And it's, 
emotion, things like that. It's going to be very neutral. Okay, so don't copy this. you got to add in all the stuff. I'm just going to tell you what it means, okay? So, <clears throat> when a manservant shall play the cur with him, look you, it goes hard. One that I brought up of a puppy. One that I saved from drowning when three or four of his blind brothers and sisters went to it. So that means uh, when a master's servant behaves like a dog to him, it's rough, it's hard. I brought this particular dog, Crab, up when he was a puppy. I saved him from drowning. Three or four of his blind brothers and sisters drowned. Okay? The next section is, I have taught him, even as one would say precisely, thus I would teach a dog. I was sent to deliver him as a present to Mistress Sylvia from my master, and I came no sooner into the dining chamber, but he steps me to her trencher and steals her cape and leg. So that means I have taught him, even as one would say precisely, I would teach a dog like this. And I was sent to deliver him as a present from my master Proteus to Mr. Sylvia. But as soon as I got to the dining room, he runs to her plate and steals her chicken leg. Next part. Oh, tis a foul thing when a cur cannot keep himself in all companies. I would have, as one should say, one that takes upon him to be a dog indeed, to be, as it were, a dog at all things. So that means, oh, it's terrible when a dog can't behave himself and just act normal in social situations and in different company. But, you know, as they say, I happen to have a dog that's a dog. A dog in everything he does. He just acts like a dog, basically. Okay, then the next section. If I had not had more wit than he, to take a fault upon me that he did, I think verily he had been hanged for it. Sure as I live, he had suffered for it. You shall judge. You know, and that means, you know, if I didn't have more intelligence or wisdom than he did, to plead guilty for his wrongdoings, he would have been hanged or punished for it. For as sure as I live, he's suffered for it, as you'll see. All right, so basically he's saying that the dog would have been punished many times if it wasn't for him taking the blame for what the dog did. He th okay, here's the next part. He thrust me himself into the company of three or four gentlemen-like dogs under the Duke's table. He had not been there, bless the mark, pissing while, but all the chamber smelt him. So he runs into the company of three or four really well-behaved dogs that were under the Duke's table when he got there. And he hadn't been there very long, as long as time it takes to urinate, and everybody in the room smelled him. So, so most people in this part say the dog peed and that's what everybody smells and that's what dogs do, they pee all over the place sometimes. But some people, a few people, say the dog farted and that's why he smells. And then some people say, oh, the dog just smelled bad and he was sitting there. But the most common thing and the one that I would probably go with is that the dog peed because that's what dogs do most time that's what most people can relate to okay cool so this next part the fun part where the actor gets to play different characters and different voices so after everyone smells him and sees his dog pees they try to get rid of the dog so this is how it sounds and don't copy my voice here i'm just going to do some different voices but you experiment with voices that you're most comfortable with that think that you think work okay out with the dog says one what cur is that? Says another. So you could do two different voices there, okay? Whip him out! Says the third. So the more diverse these voices are, the better. Hang him up! Says the duke. Okay? So, that translated. Get that dog out of here! Someone says. Whose dog is that? Someone else says. Whip him! Beat him! Third one says. Hang him! Says the duke. Basically, put him to sleep what the Duke is saying, okay? 
So the next part is, I, having been acquainted with the smell before, knew it was crab. And goes me to the fellow that whipped the dog. Friend, quoth I, you mean to whip the dog? I marry do I, quoth he. You do him the more wrong, quoth I. T'was I did the thing you wot of. Okay, so um, let's go back to the sort of translation of that, okay? Since I know that smell, I knew it was crab. So I went to the man that wanted to whip the dog, and I said, Friend, buddy, pal, are you going to whip the dog? Yes, I am, he says. Well, you'll make things even worse for him if you do that, I said. And then he confesses. He says, That was me. That wasn't the dog. I was the one who did that thing you know about. Okay? So... The next part is what the guy does. He makes me no more ado, but whips me out of the chamber. Okay, that means he doesn't talk to me anymore. He doesn't argue with me anymore about it, but he kicks me out. Or they beat him, and then they kick him out. Okay? So the next part, how many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, I'll be sworn, I have sat in the stocks for puddings he hath stolen, otherwise he had been executed. I have stood on the pillow for geese he hath killed, otherwise he had suffered for it. Now think it not of this now. So what he's saying is, how many masters would do this for their servant? Since the dog is his servant, technically. Nobody, I swear. I have sat in the stocks, which is a form of punishment, a public display of punishment, for sausages he stole. Otherwise, if I wouldn't have done that, he would have been executed. I've also been punished for geese he's killed and eaten. Otherwise, he would have been punished for it. Don't think about this now, okay? That is that translation. And then, so the last part, nay, I remember the trick you served me when I took my leave of Madame Sylvia. Did not I bid thee still mark me and do as I do? When didst thou see me heave up my leg and make water against the gentlewoman's farthingale? Didst thou ever see me do such a trick? So, what he says is, No, I remember the trick you played on me when I left Madame Sylvia. Didn't I always ask you, he's talking to the dog, didn't I always ask you to pay attention to me, just like I pay attention to you? When have you ever seen me raise up my leg and pee on a gentlewoman's skirt? Have you ever seen me do such a trick? Okay, and that's it. So there's a lot of fun you could do with this monologue, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, so then what you'll want to do next is break the monologue into beats, right? And most of you know how to do that already, where you separate it into sections based on what the character's objective is and what they're doing to attain that objective. Okay, so you mark with a slash where the beat changes. And I'll leave that up to you because everybody has different opinions of where a beat changes sometimes, right? So an example of a beat change in this monologue would be in line 28, when he says, he makes no more ado, but whips me out of the chamber. How many masters would do this for his servant? So that first sentence is one beat, or part of one beat. He makes me no more ado, but whips me out of the chamber. Talking about what happened when he got beaten and kicked out. So then you put a slash there because this is the new beat. How many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, I'll be sworn. I have sat in the stocks, etc., etc. So he starts talking about how many masters would do this for his servant and all the things he's gone through for the dog. So there's the beat change. So there. then what you should do is you should assign each beat a verb because. The root word of actor is act, action. So it's all about doing. OK, 
try not to write down emotions because that is a result. That's not what you're actually doing. You can do something like beg somebody to come back to you and the emotion could be sadness or frustration, but you don't play the sadness or the frustration. You play the begging, the imploring the person to come back to you and the sadness and frustration comes out of that, right? This is stuff we all know, but it's stuff that we have to practice over and over again to the point where you just automatically do it and you automatically play the action and the emotions come. So in those beats we were talking about, uh, the more direct verb you can pick is, is best. So even if the verbs are figurative, so you could put something like stab and you're not literally stabbing anybody, but it, it could be something for the actor to use. I stab you with this line. You know, I'm hurting you, okay? So you could use a lot of figurative things to help you maneuver your way through the actions and tactics that the character is taking to pursue their objective, okay? So for example, in this beat that we just went through, where he says, he makes me no more do, but whips me out of the chamber. If that were a beat, it might be something like, it might be something like, inform. I inform you. Okay, he's informing them what happened. Okay, and then the next beat, how many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, I'll be sworn. I have sat in the, he keeps talking. So that might be something like, He's trying to get pity or not pity, but understanding from the dog. So it might be, it might be something like convince or sway to make them understand or, or pull. Okay. Floor even. It's up to you to use different verbs that will help you really understand what the character is doing, the action that the character is taking, literally or figuratively, to the other character to get their objective. So you could mark up the whole monologue, and it should be full of pencil or pen marks, right? And that'll help you to really give it a lot of color and nuance. It's also important to figure out the arc of the monologue. Where are they in the beginning and then where are they at the end and how do they get there? And if you were doing the play, it might be different, right? Because you're doing the whole play, so the arc in that monologue might be different. If you're doing the audition, an audition, and you only have this two minutes, it's important to really show as wide of an arc as possible to the auditioner, right? So the context might be a little bit different in the monologue. You might use a bigger arc. Does that make sense? Great. If it doesn't, email me and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, get back to you. So if you're thinking of the monologue, you want to think of four things that spell out the word core or crow. Some people use crow, some people use core. Character, objective, relationship, environment. Character, we talked about. Objective, relationship, and environment. Environment, you can make up. He just, he just came back from this ordeal, right? So uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that a little bit, but make sure you're clear in your head where the environment is, okay? Is he in the town square? Is he in front of, you know, the, the mansion or palace, wherever he is, okay? And, and then relationship, who he's talking to. So in this monologue, he's talking to the audience. And so in an audition situation, I would have you maybe create a character that he could be talking to, whether it's someone he ran into on the street maybe a friend of his, 
Maybe he's directing the whole thing to the dog, right? Because he doesn't have many friends, so he talks to the dog. Okay, so make that decision and make him talking to somebody specific that will give you more focus in the monologue. It'll make your monologue clearer, okay? So another important thing to think about is the moment before, the moment before this monologue started. So he just got beaten up and kicked out. So he's probably out of breath, you know, a little uh, shaken up and, you know, maybe there's people staring at him that are walking by. So you should portray that physically, physically show, you know, being out of breath. Uh, trying to corral the dog, those things that I showed you earlier with the dog, and and use that, and then get settled. So I would use maybe the first, you know, five to ten seconds of a monologue to sort of establish that moment before, right, where you're just trying to get your wits about you. Maybe you sit on a stoop and then start talking out of breath, maybe take a drink of water or something like that, okay? So think about that and make that choice. So we'll go through some of the moments of the monologue and I'll kind of show you different things you can think about, okay? So one thing that I would recommend you doing is to physicalize this monologue as he is telling this story to almost act it out. You know, like you're telling someone on the street, a beggar on the street, or someone walking by, or the dog, and you're acting it out. At the same time you're trying to act it out, maybe the dog gets distracted by something and tries to, you know, pull you away. And so find those spots where that could serve the story. Okay? So let's say you enter, and you're out of breath, and you're beat up, and... The sun is bright and it's hot, people are staring at you, and you sit down and, oh, catch your breath, and then you can start the monologue, all right? I'm going to read it neutrally, don't copy the way I say it, okay? When a man's servant shall play the cur with him, look you, it goes hard. So, that's, oh, it's hard when, when a man's servant shall play the cur with him, when the man, when the servant is uh, the master, oh, it's hard. Right? So think about that, what that beat might be, what that verb might be, and then you can play that. So maybe you're sitting there and you're out of breath, okay? And then you talk about you saved the dog from drowning, and you can follow along too in your monologue. You don't need to look at me. That's not fine. I know I'm really good looking, but that's okay. Uh, so when three or four of his blind brothers and sisters went to it. So, you know, maybe you do something like a you know, like a respectful sign of the cross there, you know. Um, and a lot of this also depends on your your interpretation of the character as well, okay? That's why I don't want to, I don't want to act any of it. I want you to make those decisions. I'm just giving you things to think about, okay? And then so when you say, I have taught him, even as one would say precisely, thus I would teach a dog, I was sent to deliver him as a present to Mistress Sylvia from my master. So maybe you get up, you're like, I was sent to deliver him, right? And, you know, it's hard for you. So maybe there's a moment of, you know, all right, you know, we're going to do this. And then you walk in. So you're acting it out as you're talking about it. And I came no sooner into the dining chamber, but he steps me to a trencher and steals her cape and like, so maybe you're walking and then... And then as I'm walking through, oh, you, you could do the dog thing again. And then he, he eats her chicken, her capon's leg, and then, oh, and you react to that. So try not to just rely on the words to tell the story, right? Do a lot of it with action and then your reaction to it. Oh, he's eating the food. Oh, <laughs> and maybe you're, you're trying to... <laughs> play it off, everyone's staring at you, and you're like, oh, <laughs> let me just grab it here, right? You could just play it off like that, however you would do it in your character, okay? 
Oh, tis a foul thing when a cur cannot keep himself in all companies. Oh, I can't take this dog anywhere. <laughs> um, or maybe that's something that you're saying to them, right? To the people there. <laughs> oh, tis a foul thing when a cur cannot keep himself in all companies. Something like that. So that's your choice, okay? Uh, and again, when you do the beats first, this will help you to make these decisions of of who to direct certain parts of the monologue to and when you're reenacting the story how you should do it physically okay um i would have as one should say one that takes upon him to be a dog indeed to be as it were a dog at all things you know so decide how that makes you feel if you're just like well He's just being a dog, or if you're really frustrated about it, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with him, or, well, that's life, he's a dog, dogs act like dogs, right? So that's up to you, too. If I had not more wit than he to take a fault upon me that he did, I think verily he had been hanged for it, hanged for it, sure as I live. He had suffered for it, you shall judge. All right, so, again, when you do the beats, and when you decide what your actions are, that will, that will inform how you deliver those lines, okay? Um, so then you, he goes back to the story. He thrust me himself into the company of three or four gentlemen like dogs. You could reenact that as well, doing the physicality of it. Under the Duke's table, maybe you, you act, you can even act like a dog under the table, right? So when he says three or four gentlemen like dogs, you can be one of the gentlemen like dogs, you know, one of the really well-behaved German shepherds or whatever they are. And then you're the other dog, you're like, <laughs> you can reenact the dog, like being what Crab did and how he doesn't fit in, okay? He had not been there, blessed the market pissing while, but all the chamber smelt him. And then you can, you can reenact that too, like what the people are doing, they're trying to be all proper, and then they're like, Ugh. and then everyone's trying to figure out where it came from, but they might be like, oh, was that me, what, what was that me, you know, um, and so you can act like those people, and, or you can act like, like what you did, what, what Lance did, he might have been like, oh, 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 that's, that's, that's crap. So, trying to just reenact the people's reactions when they smell the dog or when they notice the dog peed, right? And then, this is the part where you can reenact the other characters. So, you can reenact the different characters. So, you would go stand, maybe take a step to the left, take, get into character with the one noble character, out with a dog, says one, and then go to another part. What cur is that? And maybe it's a totally different character, right? You can even, you can even switch genders. You could be anybody. So the more diverse you make those characters, the better it is because it'll show your versatility a little bit more in the two minutes that you have for this audition. Okay, then you could say, Whip him out, says the third. So, so three different voices, right? You can even use three different accents if you want. All right, and then hang him up, says the Duke. And then, and then you could show your reaction. Hang him up. Oh, they're going to, they're going to, oh, wait. And you can run around and uh, trying to, oh, hold on, wait, wait. Uh, or, or you could be like trying to be like, what, what are you talking about? What? Why are they all upset? Are they talking to you about my dog? And then you start to realize they're talking about your dog. I, having been acquainted with the smell before, knew it was crab. And, and goes me to the fellow that whips the dog. Oh, wait, friend. And you're imploring, right? You're trying to get him to, to have mercy on the dog. And, and then he asks him, oh, oh, you mean to, to whip the dog? And then you can go back into the other character, maybe take a step to the left. I marry, I do I, I marry, do I, quoth he. Oh, I, 
you then go back to acting like yourself or like Lance. You do him more the wrong, quoth he, quoth I. Twas I did the thing you ought of. So he confesses, or he falsely confesses, and he takes the blame for it. He makes no more ado, but whips me out of the chamber. And then so when you say you whipped me out of the chamber, you could do like a, oh, they're beating you up kind of thing. And, and then maybe you take the dog, and the dog runs out, and oh, <laughs> you're like, bye, see, see you all later. And then you run out. <sighs> and then you take a moment to catch your breath again. And so you're back out on the steps. And then now you're thinking about it. How many masters would do this for his servant? Oh, I do so much for you, okay? So that's your choice too. Are you, are you mad at the dog? Are you like, look at everything I do for you. I take so much heat for what you do. I take the blame for everything you do. Or could it be, oh man, I, I must really love you because how many people would do this for you? I have done this and this and this for you. I have sat in the stock for puddings he hath stolen. Oh, what, what? I, and what? And maybe it's like a, a realization that, gosh, I must really love you kind of thing. Or maybe it's like a, what am I doing? Oh, jeez, this can only go on for so much longer. And again, based on the character you created, your core, that will dictate how you react and how you deliver these lines. Okay, so how many masters would do this for a servant? Nay, I'll be sworn. I have sat in the stocks for puddings he has stolen. Otherwise, he had been executed, meaning he would have been executed if I didn't do that. I have stood on the pillory for geese he has killed. Otherwise, he had suffered for it. Thou thinkest not of this now. Okay? Nay, I remember the trick you served me when I took my leave of Madame Sylvia. Did not I bid thee still mark me and do as I do? When didst thou see me heave up my leg and make water against a gentlewoman's farthingale? Didst thou ever see me do such a trick? So, it's up to you then if you're reprimanding the dog, or if you're just bewildered by the dog, or if you kind of love the dog, and that's just our relationship. That's what we do. That's why I love you. Or any other um, way you might think of to deliver that line, okay? So then you should find a way to end the monologue as well after your last line. Didst thou ever see me do such a trick? Maybe you, oh well, and walk off. Now in the play, he gets interrupted because two other characters enter and a, and a whole other scene starts. But obviously that's not gonna happen in your audition unless you bring actors with you and do the whole play for them, which is not advised, but that's okay. So then maybe the dog pulls you again, pulls you like I showed you earlier, right? And then, oh, here he goes again. He wasn't listening to me that whole time. I just went through that beating for him or her. And, um, <clears throat> and I went through all this, and now I'm out here, and, oh, he's just going looking for more food. Oh, well, and you can exit. All right, so that might be a good way to end it there. So when you're working at the, on the beats of the monologue, it will really help you color the monologue and give it a lot of texture and layers. So when you're picking the verbs, uh, obviously you pick verbs that make sense. You could pick figurative verbs or literal verbs. But it might also be interesting or helpful to pick random verbs that don't make any sense and you might discover something that works um so i mean we could try it for one of the beats here so for example after he gets he talks about getting beaten up and kicked out of the chamber for taking the blame for what the dog did his line is how many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, I'll be sworn, I have sat in the stocks for puddings he hath stolen, otherwise he had been executed. So, you could say that that beat is, maybe he is berating the dog because he's frustrated. So, that might be something like, how many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, 
I'll be sworn. I have sat in the stocks for puddings he has stolen. Otherwise, he had been executed. Or you could do something like if he's talking to a bystander and he's trying to get pity and he's exasperated, um, his verb might be something like... Maybe it's a verb like burdening. You're burdening the person you're talking to with all of these things that, uh, that you're going through to show all the things that the dog is doing to you. So you're burdening the person you're talking to with these facts. It might be, how many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, I'll be sworn I have sat in the stocks for puddings they have stolen. Otherwise, he had been executed. I have stood on the pillory for geese he had killed. Otherwise, he had suffered for it. So you see the difference there? And then maybe you pick a, a random verb just to see how it sounds, a verb that doesn't make sense. So maybe something like... Um, like belittling or condescending, okay? So then it might sound something like this. How many masters would do this for his servant? Nay, I'll be sworn I have sat in the stocks for puddings he had stolen. Otherwise, he had been executed. I have stood on the pillory for geese he had killed. Otherwise, he had suffered for it. Thou thinkest not of this now. So you see the difference there. You could play with it and try different verbs and different things and different beats and see what works based on the character you created. And of course, once you create the character, it doesn't have to stay that way. You can, you can change it, tweak things, see what works best. But it's important that you have a, a, a base of the character where you're rooted in that character, that'll inform the verbs you choose for the beats and how you deliver on that. So hopefully it'll get to the point where you're not thinking about the beats, but where you are simply reacting, right? Because acting is reacting, right? And it's becoming natural to you, okay? You're just pursuing your objective and these beats are coming naturally. And you'll get the timing of it because then on top of that you have to add, you know, the physicality and the idiosyncrasies of the character. But you can have a lot of fun with it. Really try to add as much physical comedy to it and as much humor, but make sure it's physical comedy that adds to the story, right? Don't just, don't just pretend to be the peeing or farting dog just because that's funny, right? Uh, so what a lot of people do is they, they focus on the, uh, like, blue humor in Shakespeare, and they try to overemphasize that to the detriment of the story. Try to make your physical movement be funny and inform the story as well. And I think you will do a great job with it. I would love for you to do it and uh, show me if you send them to me. That would be great. I would just love to see if I was able to help you in any way. Hopefully I was. You know, take, take what you can out of it and uh, see what you can do with it for an audition. I think it's a good choice for a monologue because it's not done very much. Everyone does that other monologue, which is a great monologue as well. But then there's a lot of traps you can fall into when you do a monologue that everybody does and that everybody is expecting. This is a nice change of pace for people to see. So if you do this one really well, it really shows uh, your versatility and it can really show your understanding and knowledge of the text and uh, portraying this character. So have fun with it, you guys. I miss all my students, the ones that I haven't seen in forever. Congrats to the graduating seniors. And uh, I will see you all real soon, hopefully. Stay safe. Bye-bye.